look at that. Well, this is so timely for you to offer those resources for all of us in this pandemic world. Um, thank you so much. So one of the most popular questions, uh, Dr. Meichenbaum, is what would you say something about black and indigenous and trans people undergoing a lot of grief and trauma? Um, uh, clearly, each of those groups uh, have high incidences of self-injurious and suicidal behavior. So, in fact, we did a thing on how to boast the resilience in LGBTQ. And in that uh, handout that you could download, transgender individuals have a higher likelihood of being victimized um, and engaging in suicidal behavior. I've also uh, been involved with native populations. I, um, uh, there was a community up north in Canada, sort of like the Inuit, who were rather nomadic and uh, went around following the caribou. And when the caribou became ill, they uh, became uh, put into, they didn't call it reservations, but you can imagine the cultural stress of happening. The government also was well-intentioned and uh, brought in a reading specialist for the young children there. Unfortunately, the reading specialist turned out to be a pedophile who sexually abused 86 boys over the course of three years. That particular cohort, like the Alaskan Natives, also have a high incidence of victimization of one form or another, and there's a high incidence of suicide. And in terms of uh, African-American populations, uh, where you see high incidence of violence, and in fact, the Melissa Institute just uh, completed a program on how to help bystander interventions with the police on how to defuse violent situation like the George Floyd one. So there are a number of resources. Here's, here's my answer to what could be done. Keep in mind that the depression suicide is only part of the story that clients have to tell. And that the, there is a need to also find uh, any evidence of resilience, any redeeming features or stress that people have. Keep in mind that the research indicates that the most important suicide prevention tool in a clinician's repertoire is a sensitive, empathic, non-judgmental therapeutic alliance. So if you read the work by Rudd and Mongor and other people in this area, on the hand, uh, no matter what particular technique, assessment tool, uh, any of the cognitive behavioral interventions that I enumerate in the handout, they will only work insofar as we can establish, maintain, and most importantly, monitor the quality and nature of the therapeutic alliance. So I included in my presentation some of the work by Miller, Duncan, Chow, and others on how to use feedback-informed treatment. Therapists often overestimate the quality and contact between the client and the therapist. And insofar as you have an ongoing assessment of suicidality and try to look at protective factors. In fact, I've done a number of consultations for native groups, both in Canada and the United States. And there's a marked differences in different kinds of tribes, for example, in the United States and the degree to which you could have a supportive environment. It's not only what goes on in the therapy office, but what is the nature of the therapeutic environment that becomes really critical? For example, with native populations, the degree to which they can incorporate the use of elders or rituals and the like. In fact, one of the most effective modes of interventions has to do with the Air Force suicide intervention program and has significantly changed the stigma attached for going for help, the nature of the way in which you could use peer assessment for high risk and the degree to which there can be follow-up. One final example of the Quality and Therapeutic Alliance is that the VA now has adopted some studies by Otto and their colleagues. And what they found out is that when suicidal patients are discharged from the hospital and they actually send out a postcard, an email, some other kind of communication with the suicidal patient who's been discharged 
to indicate the degree of care and concern, the degree to which the patient can come back for help. It turns out that that kind of minimal intervention has proved to be a valuable therapeutic tool. So while the risk is going up, there's good news. I summarize some seven different interventions in the handout, and each of them have been successful in reducing suicide and self-injurious behavior by up to 50%. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think we'll, we'll go on to the other questions, but yeah. I think that some of the resources would be helpful. Excellent. Thank you.